you all have uh, heard me speak of my family before. Uh, I, I tend to use them a lot in my sermon, and uh, I, I kind of feel bad for my family because they really do become the subjects of my sermons and my stories, and I tend to embarrass them a little bit. But at the same time, I don't feel sorry for them because they're my family, and, well, they, they signed up for it when they had me. So that's their fault. Uh, but my family, I love, to, I love my family so much. And, and if you all remember, uh, my, most of my family, actually all of my family, live in California, uh, where I was born and raised. Uh, but not all of us live in California. My sister happens to live in Connecticut, so across the country. Uh, and so because of that, I don't get to see her and my brother-in-law and uh, all of them often. Uh, it was a little easier... Uh, when I lived in Berrien Springs in Michigan, uh, when I was attending school there, because it was only a 14-hour drive uh, to Connecticut. Sounds like a lot, but eh, I could do it. It was nice. It was fun. Uh, especially when you got into Pennsylvania and then started going into New York. Oh, wow. The drive, the, the hills. I called them mountains this morning, but I don't think they're really mountains. Uh, but the hills, just so green. Um, and when I drove by through there, for some odd reason, it was always raining, but it was green. And it was beautiful just to see the clouds, the rain, um, and, and every once in a while, a rainbow going over the hills. It was just a beautiful drive. So it really made it worth it to drive the 14 hours to go see my family. Um, and and uh, I do have uh, four, four, four of them. Um, I have three nieces and one nephew. Um, and actually, I think my niece, the oldest one, uh, I think she's actually a lot taller than me now. Uh, so uh, I, I can't really hug her as much because she just towers me, I think. I haven't seen her in a while, so it could, I don't know. Uh, but uh, I, love to, to, if, I would love to spend time with them as much as I could. Um, like I said, being in Berrien, it was so much easier to do that. Uh, but whenever I, I go see them, I just love to spend time with my nieces and, and my nephew. Um, one thing that I would do, uh, or that they would do, is when they knew I was coming, uh, and, and as soon as I walked in through the door, they would run away from me. Uh, they wouldn't allow me to hug them. Uh, and so uh, my older niece, she kind of got over it pretty quick. Um, my, my nephew in the middle there, he, when he was a lot younger and I would hug and kiss him, he would always say, Mommy, save me, Mommy, save me. Uh, and then the other, my other little niece says, uh, one of them has grown out of it. Uh, but the one that's doing the peace sign, she still hasn't grown out of this phase of, I do not want affection from you. Uh, she's very much kind of the antisocial one of the family. Uh, and uh, so what I would do is when I would go to see them and she saw me or heard me coming to the, through the house, she would immediately try to run. Uh, but I am much bigger and faster uh, than her. So I would grab my niece and I would force love on her. And I would just grab her and I would hug her and I would give her kisses and she'd try to squirm her way uh, away from me, uh, but she couldn't because I'm a lot stronger. So I would just hold on to her and kiss her, kiss her, kiss her, hug her and tell her how much I love her and that I'm so happy that I was there to see her and to spend time with her. And uh, she, she, I would do this every time that I saw her and, and it, it, were, it paid off. It paid off because as, as time came, uh, she would actually sit with me and we would have fun. I would pull out my phone and we would go on Instagram or Snapchat and use one of those funny filters. Um, and, and she would be like, oh, let's do another one. Oh, that's so funny. And she would just laugh hysterically. Uh, so, uh, but she came to this spot because of the love that I showered on her. The love that I gave her, she learned to say, oh, my uncle does love me. He's just not doing this to annoy me. He, he really much loves me. But I only, this only happened because I showered her with love. If you'll join me uh, this morning in the book of Luke. Luke uh, is where we're going to spend our morning. Uh, Luke chapter 15 
Uh, there are several stories in this, in this chapter. We're not going to look at all of them. We're only going to focus on one of those stories. Uh, and it's a well-known story. It's a popular story. We all know it. We have heard it. Uh, and it, it's, it's an amazing story to read. Um, our verse that was read is found in verse 20, but we're going to start at the beginning of this story in verse 11. So Luke chapter 15, verse 11. And this is what Scripture says. Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them to them his livelihood. Now from this, these two set of verses, we can gather three things. The first thing we gather is that this father or this man was a wealthy person. He was wealthy, maybe even an authority figure. Uh, but we know he was wealthy because Scripture tells us that he had, uh, his son came to him and said, Father, give me what is mine. Clearly, the father had something to give if the son is demanding his portion of it. So the first thing, the father, this man, is a wealthy man of authority, probably. The second thing that we, can, uh, that we gather from this text is actually, in, 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 in biblical times, it was very common for fathers to divide the inheritance among his children prior to death. So before the father died, he would say, all right, you, my oldest son, are getting this. You, my other son, are, are getting this. But they didn't get their inheritance until the father passes. So the second thing we gather is he already divided everything among his kids, among both of his sons. The third thing we can gather from this is the young son knew what he wanted, or better yet, the young son thought he knew what he wanted. How many of us have found ourselves in the young son position and knew what we wanted? Or better yet, how many of us knew or thought we knew what we wanted? Let's continue reading here. And not many days after, the young son gathered all his belongings together, uh, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Now, it's interesting that Scripture says a far country. Uh, scripture is not one of those books that just adds things to kind of take up space. Uh, when Scripture mentions something, it's because it's important. Uh, we need to understand why Scripture mentions something. So the fact that Scripture here tells us that the young son uh, gathered his belongings and left his father and went to a far country tells us something very important. The young son wanted to be away from the influence of his father. There's a little joke that I, that I always tell with my parents. Um, I always mention to them, I said, hey, you guys know why I went to Union, right? And they said, yeah, to study nursing. And I said, actually, no, it was to get away from you. And they're just like, well, how mean. You're, who, you, you're not gonna leave, we're not going to leave anything in our will for you. I said, you don't have anything to give me, so that's okay. But it's a little joke that I tell them that I was trying to get away from the influence that my parents could have on me, which, like I said, is a joke, so please mind that. Uh, but the son here in this case, it was not a joke. He very much wanted to leave his surrounding, he wanted to leave the area of which his father could easily watch him and influence him to do things or maybe even spend his possessions in another manner than what the son wanted to. So again, how many of us have found our spot, ourselves in the spot of the younger son of wanting to leave the influence of our Heavenly Father? How many of us have wanted just to take a step back Gather what God has given us. Take a step back and say, I am going to leave, and I'm going to go away far from your influence. How many of us have been uh, in that situation of leaving the Father who cares for us, the one who should be influencing us? Sometimes we just don't want to listen to that influence, and we decide, God, it's time for me to leave. 
Continuing reading. But when he had spent all when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. So he was out of money. He ran out of money. And when I read these, these stories, um, I, I kind of like to picture of what was going on at this time. So, so the son goes to his father and says, Dad, I know you're not dead, but I want my belongings. I want what is mine. I'm going to leave this country, and I'm going to leave the influence of which you have over me, and I'm going to live my entire life uh, apart from you. So the father says, well, okay. Uh, so here's your inheritance, and he left. And as he's living his life, oh, he is having a good time. Oh, he is going out every night. He is meeting people. He probably has good friends, and he is just having so much fun spending all this money that he has because he is a wealthy man now. He's probably buying the, the hottest things that are on the market, and he is just living life until one day he takes out that card to charge something, and it says decline because he was out of money. I picture at that moment that all of his friends left his side. Because who wants to be friends with someone who has no money, right? But the point is, is he found himself to be in want. He had no money. How many of us have found ourselves to be in want? Maybe it's a financial want. Maybe it's a want of, of joy, or of happiness, or, or of a relationship. But how many of us have found ourselves to be like this young son and be in want? Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. So what happened? He ran out of money. So what did he have to do? He had to go work. So he went out and he got himself a job. But not just any job. He was feeding the pigs. He began to, to work with them and, and to feed them and maybe even clean up after them or whatever little cleaning they did. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but that's what, he, uh, that's what he was offered. That's the only thing that was there was for him to feed the pigs. And for you have to understand, for a Jew to touch pigs was degrading. On top of that, he went to work for a citizen of the country. Or in other words, a Gentile. Put those two together, and you are might as well just not call yourself a Jew anymore because you are two and two things you're not supposed to do. Be with a Gentile and touch and work with pigs. So in his mind, he began to degrade himself, and he began to think that he was not worthy of what he was doing. But notice what Scripture also says. He would have gladly filled his stomach with the paws that the swine ate. He was so hungry... That as he was feeding the pigs, whatever he was feeding the pigs, that became delicious. And he looked at it and he said, I could eat this because I am so hungry. Yet no one gave him anything to eat. Did he eat the food? I don't know. But he sure thought about it. To him, that looked very really good to eat because he was in want. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So here in verse 17, he came to his senses. He was like, What am I doing? Why am I in a pigsty? Why am I handling pigs and, and smelling all of this? I mean, I don't know how many of you have walked by pigs. They don't smell clean. They are not one thing to say, hey, let's go ahead and 
take out a nice little picnic basket in and just kind of have a, a nice little tea here right next to the pigs. That's not what you do. You want to be away from, from the pigs. Uh, in my previous district, um, I... I lived an hour away from Pueblo, so if you know where Pueblo is, um, I lived an hour away um, east from Pueblo in a little farming community, um, and it was very small, very small community. And um, I remember one night, it was a beautiful summer night, uh, and uh, I was just like, you know what, I'm not going to turn on the AC, I'm going to open the windows, I'm going to let that nice fresh air. Well, I'll go through my, my house. Oh, it's going to be great. I'm going to save a couple of bucks on the AC. Let's do this. So I went through my house and I opened windows. I even opened my front door and let, let, to let the screen out. It, oh, it was just an amazing thing. And then I sat on my couch and I turned on my TV. And then I just take a deep breath and I go... And I almost threw up because I was just like, what is that smell? I was just like... Okay, it's not me, because I, I know I showered this morning, and I'm just like, what? And I went around my house, and I was just like, what is that smell? I, and I looked, I was like, nothing died. Uh, what is going on? So I go outside, and again, I kind of not take a too deep of a breath, but I go, and I'm just like, oh, it's coming from outside. Well, little did I know, I mean, I'm a city boy, so I know nothing about the country. Little did I know that at night, some of the farming communities like to turn the soil that the cows sit on. And so as they did that, this methane gas or whatever it is just kind of started to ooze through the air and I was smelling nothing but manure. That's what I'm assuming pigs smell like. So imagine having to sit next to pigs. You don't want to sit there. So the son started to come to his senses and he began to say, what am I doing? Why am I here? Why am I touching these nasty animals? When the scripture says that he, he thought to himself, my father's servants eat better than me. I'm pretty sure his father's servants had a roof over their head. So he begins to think to himself, what am I doing? I have to go back home. I have to go back home, but I am unworthy to be called my father's son. So I'm going to tell my dad, hey, I'm unworthy, I, I can't do that, so I'm going to work for you. Hire me so I can eat. Hire me so I can have a roof over my body. Church, how many of us think that we are unworthy to be called a child of God? How many of us have done some things where we're just like, am I really worthy to be called a child of God? Maybe I should go to God and be like, God, I'm not, I'm not worthy enough to be called your child, so I'm just going to bow out for, for a little bit. Or better yet, how many of us have made somebody else feel unworthy to be called a child of God. This is where the story gets real good. And he, the son, arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. So, so the son, after coming to his senses, said, hey, I'm going to go. And I'm pretty sure as he was walking to his father's house, he was repeating what he was going to say. Have you ever practiced a speech that you're doing or, or something? You know how you practice it often? I'm pretty sure that's what the son did. Father, I'm unworthy. Please hire me. Father, I am unworthy. Please hire me as your servant. So I'm pretty sure he was repeating it over and over. But as he began to go home, as, as he started to get closer to home, Home, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran to him. Now, church, there's something we need to understand. People in, the, in, in biblical times, when they are a figure of authority, when they have wealth, they do not run. It is not in that protocol, in the royal protocol or wealth protocol, whatever we want to call it. It is not part of their living. If I, a man of authority, if I, a man of wealth, I am not going to run after somebody. 
It's quite the opposite. They're going to come to me. But notice what scripture, what, what scripture said. His father saw him, had compassion, and ran. The father forgot all of the protocol. The father left his wealth. The father left his authoritative figure behind. And he was only a father. And he ran to his son. And not only run to his son, but he, scripture says he fell on his neck. Now that sounds kind of uncomfortable. To fall on your neck. That doesn't sound like a good thing, but when you look at what Scripture is trying to say when he fell on his neck, Scripture is telling us that the Father fell to his knees and embraced his Son and kissed him. Now, mind you, where was the Son just moments before? He was working with the pig. I'm pretty sure he was muddy. I'm pretty sure there was manure all over the place. Now, the father could have easily said, Who, son, hey, I love you. I have compassion for you. Let's get you a shower, and then let's revisit this scenario again. The father could have easily done that. But the father didn't care. The only thing the father cared about was that his son was coming back home. And when he saw his son, again, he ran, he fell to his knees, and he embraced his dirty son who smelled like pigs, and he kissed him. The way the father embraced his son is the way the father wants to embrace Oh, but pastor, I'm dirty. I smell worse than pigs. I am not worthy to be called a, a, a son of God or a daughter of God. I am just not worthy. How can I do it? God doesn't care. All God cares is that you come back. And when you do, it does not matter what you did. God is going to fall on his knees and he's going to embrace you and he is going to kiss you. But here's another cool thing about this part of scripture. But when he, the son, was still a great way off, his father saw him. As the son was walking, a great way off, Scripture says. So imagine a, a mile or two miles, as ever far the eye can see. Imagine that. While he was still off, the father saw him, only to indicate that the father was stepping out on his balcony every single day waiting for his son to come back home. Church, let me tell you, God is not in the back waiting. God is at his balcony looking out to the road waiting for you to come back home every single day. He is waiting for you to come back home. The father never stopped looking for his son, just like our father never stops looking for you. And, and the son, excuse me, and he arose and came to his father, but when he, was, so he kissed him on his neck, or uh, fell and kissed him, and the son said to him, Father, uh, what he practiced, the speech that he practiced, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to, uh, to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fattened calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. You see, the son did what he said he was going to do. I'm going to tell my father this. So he did tell his father that, but the father ignored him completely. He ignored his son completely and said, no, hey, my servants, bring him clothes. Bring him sandals. Put a ring on his finger. Now, the, uh, the ring is very important in this context because in, 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 in Scripture, in, in biblical times, when someone had a ring on, that was pretty much kind of their source of power and authority because the ring had their signature on it. The ring had their crest on it. That's how they signed official documents. Today, we do what? We have a signature. The ring was very much their signature. So to put the ring on his son's hand, he is saying, hey, you are still 
my child, no matter what you did. I still love you, and to prove it, I am going to give you the thing that gives me authority. You are still my child. Why did he do all this? Because his son was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found again. Church, we have strayed away from our Heavenly Father. That is just the reality of things. We have strayed away from God. The prodigal son took out of his, all of his inheritance, left his father's home, went to a different country, wasted it, found that he was in want, came home only to expect to be a servant, but that's not what he got. Instead, he got the best welcoming party ever. How many times have we taken what God has given us for granted? Yet when we come back to God, He always embraces us. Let me tell you, there is not one time in my life that I, when I turned my back against God, there is not one time that He rejected me. Each time, He embraced me. He wants to do the same to you. Have you strayed away from God? Have you done something that makes you feel unworthy to be called a child of God? Have you taken what God has given you and wasted it? Church, when when we stray away from God, the world begins to fill our, 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 our minds and our hearts with doubt because the moment you begin to feel unworthy, and I am talking just a little, let's think of a mustard seed. If you just have that much doubt, that's all the devil needs to get in and to say, hey, you know what? You're right. You're not worthy. Hey, you know what? You're right. You, you are worthless. You belong with the pigs. You belong to, uh, with, with feeding the pigs and, and eating with the pigs. You are not worthy. That is what happens when we stray away from God. He begins to tell us that we do not have the opportunity, the honor of being called a child of the living God church, we are all prodigal sons. We are all prodigal daughters. We have all gone astray from from God and went our different ways. But let me tell you something. God is there every single day walking right alongside you. He is never going to leave you nor forsake you. He doesn't push us away Because when we do things, we tend to reek of sin. But God doesn't push you away. He says, hey, let me embrace you. He showers you with love. He showers you with love. And he rejoices because you decided to come back home. Because you were lost but now you are found. As I was studying for this sermon, I came to a question popped into my head. If if God showers us with love, regardless of what we do, why can we not shower each other with love, regardless of the things that we do? Because isn't that what we're called to do? We're called to shower each other with love. Now notice how I said we. I didn't say you are called to shower each other with love. Because I'm throwing myself in that mix. We together need to shower each other with love just like God showers us with love. And let me tell you, church, there are some times we don't deserve to be showered with love. 
But because God has so much love for us, he says, hey, your past is your past. It is done with. I am here. Let me embrace you. Why can't we do the same with each other? Imagine what would the world be like today if every single person embraced each other and showered each other with love. I would like to think we wouldn't be here on earth. I would like to think we would be in heaven with Jesus Christ. We are called to love each other. We are called to embrace each other. Were feelings hurt? Yeah. Were things said? Yeah. Were things done? Yes. But we have a God We have a God that says, I don't care about that. I care about loving you and showering you with love no matter what you did. Church, we are being called to do the same. We are called to love each other. We are called to embrace each other. Church, feel the embrace of God. Feel the showers of love that God is giving you. Because once you feel it, it will be so much easier to go around and to shower other people with love. So my question for you this morning is actually a two-part question. Will you embrace others? And will you shower people with love just like you are showered in love? May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Let us pray. Father God, we pray for these showers of blessing. And we pray that those showers may come today. Lord, we thank you for showering us with your love. I pray for an outpouring of the Spirit on each person here today. And just like we are showered with your love, may we be able to shower each other with love and embrace each other because we are a church family. We just thank you and we love you. We pray these things in your name. Amen.